Hey, it's John and welcome to the interview. Today I am joined by Paul Herman, who is the founder of The Hip Investor, which is an investment company that helps investors pursue maximum impact and profit potential at the same time. He's the author of the 2010 book, The Hip Investor, Make Big Profits by Building a Better World. And today we're going to talk a little bit about his journey as an entrepreneur, some of the twists and turns and fun times he's had along the way. Uh, a little bit of his background, what he's currently doing now at The Hip Investor, and then where he's taking things in life. So, Paul, thanks for coming by. Delighted to be here. Awesome. Well, just, just let's talk a little bit about your upbringing, kind of where you grew up, fill us in on who you are a little bit. Sure. Um, I grew up in Chicago, uh, in the middle of the U.S. Um, let's see, my mother, my father is an accountant, and uh, my mother uh, is a fan of psychology, so I'm uh, both uh, in my DNA and in my upbringing, uh, a mix of quantitative, uh, a quantitative geek as well mm. as a people person. And so you need both those skills to both left brain and right brain to uh, solve problems and not only solve the technical issue of problems, but uh, get people to buy in to how to solve those problems. Um, so I have a finance degree from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania um, and so my real passion was not, you know, how to do just financial engineering, but how to bring capital to people to solve problems. So my professional career has included advising, you know, large Fortune 500 companies on um, how to grow their business and to serve customers in a sustainable way. But also I worked at the Hanford nuclear site in uh, southeastern Washington to help clean up nuclear waste faster. Um, and I've also done work with cities along the way to how to help improve city services, uh, get to citizens and, and uh, benefit citizens. Mm. Um, so that's, uh, you know, sort of building my personal characteristics and my parents, you know, upbringing of me. I uh, was really to uh, support individual empowerment uh, because one of their beliefs, which uh, continues to be the case today, is uh, individuals don't only get, always get a fair shot against institutions. Um, and, uh, and so being able to empower individuals, solve problems so that individuals can uh, improve their own lives. And as we write about in the hit book, um, we use Maslow's hierarchy of needs to uh, boost the health and wealth and earth and equality and trust of uh, society uh, and how businesses and governments serve the citizens uh, of society in such a way where we can solve their problems and uh, make money over time. Yeah, so that's great. So yeah, so did, when, you, when you were growing up, did your parents, what, what, what were their thoughts around money? Were, was it more of like... Um you know, a tool for good or were you always this way? Like that you, you're, you're kind of combining the human impact with the profit now, right? So have you always been that way or, or has this been a revelation or was there some kind of aha moment that brought you to that way of being? Yeah, there are probably a couple of aha movement moments along the way. Certainly, you know, when I was younger, one of my goals was to, you know, retire by age 35 and, you know. Do you get there? But uh, You're still working. Still working. I'm age 50, but um, you know I'm not a. Maybe in my earlier years, people would call me a workaholic, but I'd say today I'm a missionaholic, and my missionaholic is to you know have everybody achieve the highest quality of life and and well-being. Um, so some of that came across in doing some of my management consulting work uh, when I was at McKinsey, um, of the, you know, one of the early insights was one of my early projects was um, helping uh, regulators or electric utilities um, both deliver value to people and planet as well as the profit of investors. Um, so that was an early insight. When I worked on the Hanford nuclear site, that was a big revelation to me mm -hmm. Because the half life of nuclear waste ranges anywhere from 100 to 15,000 years, depending on which type you're dealing with. And so that revelation was these are the real important problems of um, uh, income inequality and uh, environmental destruction 
that um, we could actually um, we could actually solve if we wanted to. So we, you know, the U.S. built the atomic bomb in four years, but uh, since the World War II has ended in 1945, we still have not solved uh, 70 plus years later, you know, the environmental waste created by uh, creating those nuclear uh, nuclear materials. So there's a whole systems change that's required um, across business, social sector, and government to um, problem solve across sectors, to be a multi-sector person, uh, and to use capital markets uh, to yeah. do that. So uh, several okay. aha movements along the way, and one more was you know, in my first business when we built an um, online financial platform for kids, teens, and parents. Uh, we built a system where kids could save their own money, shop with their own money with parental permission, um, invest and donate. And that's consistent with like child psychology and bringing up kids to have financial literacy. But in the course of doing that and building a business that we grew to 30,000 customers in three years, we also had large companies try and steal our intellectual property. So that um, aha movement of large companies steal from small uh, inventors to benefit their bottom line that pushed me into the world of uh, social entrepreneurship. And so I worked at Ashoka, which funds thousands of social entrepreneurs around the world, kind of like a nonprofit venture capital fund. Yeah. And what I saw there was the aha was that um, investors actually want to invest in solving problems. Uh, entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, environmental entrepreneurs actually want to um, solve those problems. And we don't have to do it as nonprofits. We could do it as for profits and do good and make money at the same time. Right. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. I was just, you know, at the conscious capitalism conference this past month and listened to a couple of speakers on that topic where, you know, you really get to choose where your money goes, right? Like in what companies and, you know, we tend to just look for a return as a stock, a general stock investor or something like that. But someone like you and your fund, it's, you know, the hip is human impact plus profit, right? Is what it stands Correct. for. Correct. And so you're actually, you have an index, I believe, that filters out stocks and bonds and, you know, investment vehicles and grades them on a, their level of, you know, positive impact on things like the environment or other things like that. Maybe Correct. you could dig into that a little bit because that's kind of a unique concept because everyone listening, you know, we tend to look for, you know, where can I put my stock and my mutual fund or whatever people are investing in, but they don't really think about, not always at least, like what are the, where, what is that money going through and towards and how is that impacting people? Yeah. I mean, essentially we've created, um, uh, you know, we've created a system, um, you know, like when you go to the movies, you see how many stars it has. Does it have one right. star or five star? Um, when you, know, you book a table on open table or you want to go out to a restaurant, you know, you see what the Google rating or the Yelp rating is, but you don't have a rating on, does your investment do good or, you know, is it sustainable and regenerative for the world or is it extractive and destructive? So what we've done at HIP is come up with a hundred point system where closer to 100 is utopia, a world that we all want to live in, um, and closer to zero is dystopia, a world that we even cannot live in, um, you know, in a world of climate crisis. <laughs> and what we do at HIP is apply that zero to 100 rating based on factors ranging from how, um, uh, how companies treat people. Do they pay them well, high or low? Um, how do they pay their CEO? How many women are on the board? Uh, what is the carbon footprint of the business? Are they um, uh, polluting the water or are they cleaning the water? Uh, and we pull all these factors together um, and we come up with a score. And that's what we use in the investment portfolios that we build and manage <laughs> and the 401k portfolios that we build and manage uh, is to apply to allocate money towards companies who are solving problems for people, planet, and trust, and avoid uh, companies that are um, uh, destroying people or destroying planet or destroying trust. And what we find is in doing that, that those portfolios that actually solve problems for people, planet, and trust, those portfolios are stronger. They can have higher returns. Uh, they're less risky. They're more resilient. 
and they can do better over time. Um, and so that's what we're able to do with investors and uh, college endowments and uh, environmental foundations who are our clients is to help them invest their money to both do good and make money at the same time. Right. And you mentioned the profitability too. And I remember, I think I watched, saw an article on Harvard Business Review that talked about, I don't know how they necessarily classified them this way, but basically conscious companies who are more stakeholder oriented uh, over a period of time outperformed the market. Like it was like 10.5 to one or something like that. So, and you're also seeing that as well in your, your uh, portfolios as well, that they actually over time outperform these other companies. Yeah, so the Harvard study um, from 2005 and later updated again um, to look even deeper, um, like you described, they, they look at the high sustainability companies and the low sustainability companies. And uh, the high sustainability companies over periods of 10, 15, 20 years outperform uh, the low sustainability companies. There's actually more than 2,000 academic studies that show the same thing. Wow. And those academic studies use the information similar to what we use in our HIP rating to actually say, is this a company that is um, supportive of people? So one, you know, many of the listeners here may run their own companies and some of us, you know, some of us are CEOs. And frequently a CEO will say, people are our most important asset. And whenever they say that, the audience might laugh or giggle or sort of roll their eyes. And the reason is that the accounting statements treat people as a cost. They don't treat people mm -hmm. as an asset. And mm -hmm. you know, if you think about us, you want to think about do people appreciate or depreciate? And we probably want to think that we appreciate, that we get wiser or smarter or uh, can be trained more. Um, and so the next time you hear somebody say, see, you know, uh, people are our most important asset, ask them where they are in the financial statements, because the reality is the financial statements are actually part of the problem hmm. um, in trying to build a better world. They focus on minimizing labor cost instead of uh, maximizing the value of people's uh, inventions and skills and expertise. So that's one of the mm, uh, banners that we carry is investing in people it isn't, doesn't result in it might result in higher labor cost, but the return on investment of investing in people um, greatly exceeds the incremental cost or training or other yeah. benefits that you might allocate to them. Very well said. Yeah. Awesome. So that's what, that's the, the chief focus. Maybe you just can condense that into one statement. So people listening, to this can check you out. Um, I think it's at hip at hip Is that correct? correct. H I P sure. investor.com. Right. Like if you could boil it down into your, your elevator statement or whatever you want to call it, like just to give some people some clarity, like who should reach out to you and, and you know, yeah, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Sure. Yeah. So at hipinvestor.com, we have a, we have an online portal where you can check out your investments uh, to see, are they net positive or net negative for society? So are you doing good and making money at the same time? Um, we also have 401ks, retirement plans that want to, um, offer the most sustainable options. So when you're re investing for your retirement, you know, you're thinking 20, 30, 40 years into the future. So not only do you want to invest in companies that um, have a treat their people right, you want ones that are solving the climate crisis. So that have lower greenhouse gas footprints that are more energy efficient, that might be more water efficient. Um, we also work with investment advisors. So some of your listeners may have investment advisors and we work with them to help create sustainable portfolios that they can use across all of their clients. Um, so that's the uh, um, work that we do. And then we even have a partnership with Open Invest where if you only have $100 to invest, um, by, we have HIP managed strategies on Open Invest that um, for $100 and up, you can invest in the best companies to work for or a, a fossil free portfolio. Very neat. Very good. You can check that out at thehipinvestor.com. Yep. All right. So let's dig into your, your personal story as an entrepreneur, because these are always fun. You know, it's, it, I'm sure you've had some ups and downs like all of us have had, but um, here's one question I like to ask. What, what are some of the biggest risks that you've personally taken along your journey? Well, sure. One big risk is to like step off the corporate treadmill because I was a successful management consultant and sort of uh, on my way to becoming a, you know, a partner in consulting. And that um, 
for me, it was, um, I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur and create a new product, maybe like, you know, Federal Express did for Overnight Courier, or, um, uh, and hopefully create a new industry. So uh, one of those risks I took was to, you know, um, resign from being a management consultant to actually, um, as the internet was ramping up in the late 90s, to start a company using uh, technology and finance uh, to create a new product that had never existed before, which was an online financial services platform for kids, teens, and parents. Is that still and available? It is not still available. Bummer, it is I'm still a needed, child soon. but not available. <laughs> um, and the challenge there is, yeah. <laughs> Um, so the challenge is that um, financial financial services is a um, uh, you need a lot of marketing money to get in front of people. So we were able to grow it to about thirty thousand customers over three years, which was uh, compelling. And the reason was we we empowered everyday people to use money, including kids and teens. And so one of the risks we took was to take on kids and money which uh, parents don't always talk to their kids about money. Um, right. They don't always talk to their kids about sex either. Um, and so that was um, constructively controversial. Um, and the tools that um, services that we were delivering were so um, uh, powerful that even adults signed themselves up as a kid so that they could manage their own buying behavior. So we had like 22, 23 year old adults saying, oh, I wanna control my own spending. I want to put in place a, a check, a, you know, um, a gate so that I have to approve my own spending before I do it. Um, so that was one big um, risk. Um, there was another big risk when I started HIP, you know, after I left um, working for the uh, founder of eBay, uh, Pierre Midiar, um, to start a new financial company. And um, so this is 13 years ago, um, you know, the attraction of uh, doing good through your investing still was very early. So, um, so whenever you start something new, you need to know like not only is it the right product, but is it the right time? Um, and so, how did you know that? Um, well, you don't. <laughs> you don't know if it's the right time. And uh, the interesting thing about um, a new venture is, um, if you're fortunate, you have some initial customers but you don't know if you have a mass market of customers. And right. so what we've been able to navigate over the past 13 years of HIP is having enough customers to continue to grow. Um, but we're, you know, we're not yet an everyday household name like uh, some other brands. So that's what you don't, that's I think one interesting lesson is, you know, how big a market do you need? You know how big a market you want, but how big a market do you need? And what are your strategies for navigating through that? And one of those lessons is like to have at least invent something new every year, uh, to mm -hmm. always have a new idea. So I get asked to guest lecture at universities or speak at conferences. And one of the things that um, I've been able to bring every year is we have some new perspective um, uh, to bring. And so like the people, you know, where are people on the financial statements? That's one that um, is, is memorable. Yeah. Uh, a couple, couple of years ago, we started doing uh, sustainability ratings, impact ratings on uh, schools and hospitals and cities so that we could show, you know, which schools and hospitals are um, performing well for citizens and everyday people and which are not and which are funded and which are not. So um, I'd say the constant, like constant problem solving um, is helpful. And there's an old Myers-Briggs test, um, you know, sort of preferences test and uh, Myers-Briggs has tested several million people in uh, corporate America. And uh, my stress was reduced one day when um, the results of that uh, were that the people who are problem solvers uh, in any random group might only be one out of 10 people, uh, mm. but the people who are risk averse, who don't wanna change anything, uh, might be half of people. And so in any random group of 10 people, you might have one problem solver and five people who don't want to do anything. And that actually helped me my, you know, reduce my blood pressure and reduce my anxiety that, okay, uh, focusing on problem solving is, uh, 
uh, sometimes a more unique point of view than yeah. you know everybody willing to take a risk to to move yeah. forward. Yeah. So the classic kind of taking the jump towards a, an entrepreneurial career was kind of your first risk, and then starting kind of a, maybe on the on the beginning in a newer concept in in the investment world, right? It was probably a little scary. Like, is this gonna? I mean, you you felt that passion inside, but maybe it was. You know, you were you worried that you know are people going to buy into this, or is there enough? Was was the research pretty clear at that time, or not? You know, like um, I don't know. You know, was there was there was there some feelings around that when you when you jumped into hip? Well, here are some other learnings too, and my wife uh, always uh, reminds me of this. There are people who say, "Oh, if you built this, I will do it," and some of those people did not follow through. Mm. Um, and so, even like interviews or focus groups people will say one thing, but they might not do that same thing. So another big lesson is like, um, you just, you always have to be prepared for the unexpected. And I like to talk about entrepreneuring as like the highest highs and the lowest lows. Um, You know, getting a new customer is a high high and, um, you know, having another company sue you is a low low. And companies might sue you for, you know, when we had our first company, we got sued by a patent troll um, and that patent troll had no legitimate claim to our business, but because we had great media coverage for this controversial um, kids and money, um, they tried to reverse engineer something that was not related at all to try and extract, you know, extort money from us. So, um, but that's, you know, being on Such a, roller a lovely coaster. ride, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Such a great picture, everybody listening here. So. But it's true. Yeah, it's true. So what are some of the biggest mistakes you felt like? Maybe one or two mistakes that you feel you've made that looking back, you would say you would give yourself maybe a slap across the face and go stop that. You know, or like, was there some mistakes like that? I'm sure along the way that you would uh, prefer not happen. Well, let's see. Um, yeah, the, you know, the big, the big mistake, well, so in life, generally, a lot of mistakes or a regrets, I'll express it as regrets. Regrets are things you don't do, um, uh, rather than things you do do in general. So um, uh, I was fortunate to, you know, start now two companies and um, don't regret it at all. It was very fulfilling. You get to create something from scratch. Um But, you know, are there mistakes you make along the way? Sure. So we had, um, you know, some investors approach us and um, we turned them down. And the reason why we turned them down is it didn't feel right. Um, It didn't feel like a marriage. It felt like a, you know, transaction. And it would have sufficiently funded the company. And so the the regret or the mistake is did giving up that big pile of investment money, was that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, ultimately, um, you know, you can never say what that, what that was, but that, um, so that's one that I, you know, think about um, all the time. Um, you know, other mistakes are um, like in managing people. Um, I've had some people work for me where I've been resource constrained um, and I thought, well, I don't know when I'm going to find the next person. So I'm going to hold on to this person. That's not a great fit. Um, but it's a sufficient, you know, sufficient for the time. And ultimately that ends up being, um, painful for both people involved because they're a person who isn't performing as highly, isn't performing at their highest skill. You're not getting what you need, um, in terms of achieving the goals together. So being, um, uh, you know, being more uh, judicious uh, about cutting ties when it's not working out. Um, I'd say the biggest, uh, I don't know if this is a mistake. Well, it is a mistake. It's kind of a fun story. So I was on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? No um, kidding, huh? <laughs> uh, With Regis? Was on the, you know, TV game show. And um, the night before uh, I was on it, I asked my... Um, <laughs> and so the night before I, I had to practice like the yes <laughs> so that before I had to practice like what uh, four letter code to punch in A B C D um, and the answer um, that my wife said was B C A D practice B C A D on the um, in your head uh, to punch in to the who wants to be a millionaire machine 
And I said, oh, that's what I was going to say. And then we called my uh, wife's father um, and he said the same thing, BCAD. So this was the day before. Um, so I'm a very analytical person, very quantitative person. And I said, uh, okay, well, that's very interesting. So the next day on the show, um, we get to the game show. They ask a question. Um, it's the last time, it's the last round to get on before the show's time expires. And I say to myself, you know, I could just type in BCAD and I'd be fastest, but there's 15 other answers that could be the right answer. And so you talk about like mistakes and regrets, like, um, did you, did I make a mistake? So I could have typed in BCAD. I didn't. Um, I read the answer which was about celebrities and their ages to put in reverse chronological order. Uh, I started, I made a mistake, I backed up. I had the right answer. I was a fraction of a second behind the winner. Mm. And the sequence was BCAD. <laughs> which of course, you know, I beat myself up about for the next three months, which my wife hates me talking about. Um, but the lesson was sometimes just trust your gut. Yeah. And it didn't make any logical sense. There was a high, it was a high sensitivity situation. Like I could have typed in BCAD, known the answer, everybody else could have gotten it wrong and I could have won. But it shifted my um, thinking from being always analytical to sometimes like trust your feeling. Um, so that's a fun story to reflect okay. on. Very good. What are you most proud of in your life so far, Paul? Uh, well, let's see. Number one, being married happily for 20 years. Um, Congratulations. Uh, thank you. That's what I'm very proud of. And having um, flexibility of time. So being an entrepreneur, obviously you have to work a lot, but I get to, I get to be the boss of my own time. Um, so I'm proud of that. And um, uh, proud of the relationships that I have with my family and friends. Um, and that um, in building Hip Investor, uh, you know, we have three principles at Hip Investor for who we work with. Uh, one is analytical rigor, um, two is um, collaborative entrepreneurship. But the third is, and this came from a client, they call us the Nice People Network. And so what I'm really proud of is through the relationships we've created and through the people who come to us, we get to help advance and promote the nice people network. Yeah. And it's not nice people network of like, we don't do anything. It's just like, we have a vision for the world that can be better. We can do it through finance and capital markets. We can do it in a collaborative entrepreneurial way. Um, and um, it's up to us to make our world better. So uh, I'd say that's what I'm the most proud of is, creating the space and the action where people recognize it as something they want to opt into and yeah. uh, really be, you know, uh, I, I have this phrase called be the magnet. So like if you can lead by doing, you will usually be the magnet. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So how do you see your legacy or the, the kind of impact you want to leave behind in the world? Well, in the best case, it would be, um, first of all, be nice, <laughs> you know, solve problems, but be nice. Um, you know, sometimes you have to be mean because other people are jerks, but, um, you know, lead by, um, lead with a vision, lead by being nice. But um, the legacy, uh, you know, work-wise would be all investments can be net positive investments on people, planet, and trust. Um, and so just like we see, you know, on Yahoo Finance or the Wall Street Journal every day, we see the prices of investments. I'd love for us to live in a world where we see the impact of our investments. Hmm. And that, um, and so everybody's portfolio, whether it's stocks or bonds or real estate um, or cash, um, the legacy would be money migrates to the investments that solve more problems and create that positive impact because those are actually stronger, more resilient uh, investments at the same time. So love to have a, a vision and a legacy of, uh, you know, tell me what the hip rating of your portfolio is yeah. in addition to what the return of your portfolio is. It sounds like you're on your way. Why, why, why do you feel like most more 
people aren't thinking this way? Is it just because of awareness? They just don't know that this exists? Is that really what it comes down to? A lot of it is awareness and education and training. Um, uh, uh, and so that's solvable over time. That's why we wrote the hip investor book so people could, you know, read that and, and understand it and hmm. see the evidence, uh, including the academic evidence. But part of the problem is a short term versus long term. Right. Uh, it is possible in the short term to think that you're making more money by paying people less or by polluting the environment and not, you know, regenerating energy um, or by being untrustworthy and trying to, um, uh, you know, take advantage of someone. But in reality, nature rewards long term um, system multi sector solutions. Uh, and so our human nature is gets caught up in the short term uh, trickery of uh, I'm going to pay people less or treat the uh, planet in a worse way. But ultimately, we suffer for it. So um, it's that shift from long term to short term. And it's that shift of uh, patience um, from impatience. And um, it's all doable. I'm confident that the next generation of millennials and Gen Zers are action oriented and uh, comfortable with striking for the climate and taking Fridays off of school to do that, um, to actually, you know, live in a world that we all want to be in. Hmm. Yeah, very good. Awesome. Well, I uh, appreciate your time, Paul, coming by and sharing what you're up to, some of your past and, and to share some of your stories of your, your own journey and, and where you'd like to go. So any, any final thoughts that you'd like to leave behind and, and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Sure. Um, I mean, one, uh, pick a problem uh, in the world you want to solve and focus on it in your life and work. Um, uh, so that would be one. Um, lead by example, be the magnet. Um, and then just take action towards uh, helping other people succeed because that will reflect positively on you. You'll be very fulfilled about it. And, um, you know, at the f when people are at their funeral, uh, you know, what do people say when they get up and, and talk? Um, they say, you know, did that person help me? Did they help other people? They didn't say, oh, wow, that person made so much money. Um, so the good news is you can do both at the same time. You can, you know, help people, help planet, advance trust, and you can do it in your investment portfolio uh, as well. So um, I just think if we, you know, think about where we work, uh, how we shop, how we invest, and how we vote, if we are consistent in acting in our own best interests and the best interest of uh, the people around us, um, then the, you know, we can all have a fulfilling life. All right. Well said. So that's Paul Herman of the uh, hip investor. You can check it out over at hipinvestor.com. We'll link that up below the page here on the, on the blog site, as well as the uh, book, the hip investor book. You can check that out on Amazon or also on this page. And we'll link you up on LinkedIn and a few other places if anyone wants to reach out to, to Paul and, and talk more. So, Paul, thanks so much for your time and hope everybody listening to this enjoyed this discussion. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Take care, everybody.